Good uh, e afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Francesco Shelley, and uh, I'm afraid you all know me. Uh, I'm the chief of a, um, uh, I'm the chair of a endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. And today's grand rounds are going to be a slightly different. They are on research, and uh, we would like to uh, present uh, um, a series of projects uh, that all revolve around uh, the uh, use of uh, all room indirect calorimeter. So in essence, uh, this is the scheme of today's talk. Uh, um, I, will go, uh, I will give a brief introduction on the components of energy metabolism and uh, from the end user, how the all room calorimeter works. And then uh, I will uh, uh, let uh, uh, the speakers uh, going over their projects. Um, Dr. Chen uh, is an engineer and she will provide uh, uh, data and uh, the, uh, some technical uh, and important uh, piece of information on how the metabolic chamber works. Next, uh, uh, Trey Wickham uh, will uh, uh, describe uh, his current project uh, on activity related uh, energy expenditure in adolescence. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, will uh, discuss uh, uh, her project on thermic effect of food in patients with cystic fibrosis. And uh, I will uh, uh, describe uh, um, the latest project, uh, which is energy metabolism in patients undergoing thyroidectomy. And the whole point uh, is to provide uh, uh, a good uh, overview of what uh, we can uh, uh, look using uh, this instrument. You know, when you have an hammer, everything looks like a nail. When we have this toy, everything looks like uh, a question we can address with the metabolic clock. So uh, when we look, why do we look at energy metabolism? Well, uh, energy metabolism, uh, uh, it's critical, uh, particularly in this, uh, uh, um, in this state uh, of uh, uh, the other epidemics, so obesity. And uh, uh, from uh, the physiology perspective, uh, we'll use cuts this time. This is a lean and mean cut uh, from Egypt, uh, which uh, uh, is not that different, uh, actually is uh, pretty much identical from the genetic standpoint uh, with the current uh, fat cut, uh, possibly for New York, uh, gorgeous uh, on uh, uh, Big Macs, uh, but then uh, use Diet Coke. So, uh, in essence, uh, we need to understand what, why the environment becomes uh, obesogenic, and we need to measure that. And that brings uh, the concept uh, of uh, energy, uh, energy balance. What is critical understanding is the dynamic state uh, of uh, uh, energy uh, balance. In other words, uh, it's not uh, what changes uh, on uh, one specific day, but the sustained changes uh, over time, that is, is what really brings uh, weight gain or weight loss, or changes in energy metabolism for all that matters. So on the, uh, on this, on the area of uh, energy intake, what drives uh, uh, intake? Well, first and foremost uh, is how much we are hungry and how much we, are, uh, we feel full. Uh, but also the food availability. And this is probably one of the major differences. Uh, uh, it's really not written in our DNA that uh, after breakfast, there shall be a lunch and there shall be a dinner and there may be uh, snacks throughout. So probably there is some ingrained uh, uh, drive in uh, eating a bit more than we would need uh, at this specific time. Also, the caloric density is a major driver simply because uh, it doesn't take much to uh, digest uh, and to absorb uh, the food compared to eating a carcass. And uh, also important, uh, macronutrient composition. So uh, there is lots of talk in terms of uh, are we going uh, too much carbs, uh, too much fat, et cetera, et cetera. So what the macronutrient composition of food? On the energy expenditure, we really want to see what drives uh, our output of energy, or what, what makes us burning energy. Resting energy expenditure is defined uh, as uh, the minimum amount of energy required to keep ourselves alive. 
Uh, then uh, voluntary physical activities, what uh, jogging, uh, uh, if I decide to take the stairs uh, or take in the elevator, uh, how much I want to do uh, in the gym, which is not exactly uh, spontaneous physical activity. Spontaneous physical activity is more related uh, to uh, the way individuals uh, behave. So if you happen to be Italian, you see a bunch of ants moving around uh, and people, jigging, uh, people fidgeting, other people can stand still and uh, no move for the entire presentation. And believe it or not, uh, that counts in terms uh, of the total amount of energy expended. Finally, uh, diet-induced thermogenesis uh, uh, is the so-called 10% free. That means uh, uh, when we are faced uh, with a uh, calorie load, some of the energy gets dissipated beyond uh, the need uh, of uh, the requirement for digestion and absorption in a sort, sort of short loop uh, aimed to probably aimed to avoid uh, calorie overload. And finally, near and dear to me is called induced thermogenesis. So the amount of energy that we burn in excess of the resting energy expenditure to maintain our core temperature when exposed to cold. And in human, uh, cold is everything below 72 Fahrenheit. And of course, it depends uh, how you dress up. So obviously, a sustained energy intake greater than energy expenditure leads uh, to a weight gain. But uh, uh, how much, and that's uh, a bit sobering. So uh, a norm normal, uh, a 75 kilo individual takes uh, in one year roughly 1 million kilocals. And uh, uh, the average adult uh, US uh, uh, individual gain uh, roughly one kilo of fat per year. So uh, there will be 7,200 kilocals, uh, assuming a 20% water content. And uh, uh, that means uh, if you divide uh, over one year, a net positive intake uh, of uh, 20 kilocals per day, which translates uh, to ex two teaspoons of sugars. That's all it takes uh, to have a sustained weight difference. But then if you look uh, on uh, the energy expenditure, what we're looking at is a 0.7% delta energy expenditure. So this is uh, the order of magnitude we need to work in order to measure effectively changes uh, in energy expenditure. And again, uh, that's another way of looking at the difference uh, in uh, sustained energy intake. So, how do we measure? Well, we need tools, and we need a, a, a tool that helps us in getting all the components of energy expenditure, that it's sensitive, that has a good time resolution, and uh, it can be applied in a near uh, real life condition. And uh, also, since uh, this tool uh, uh, is going to be presumably expensive, we need to look uh, not at the study we want to do today, but at the studies we may want uh, to do two, three, five years down the road, uh, or the possibility that we, we haven't thought yet. So in essence, we need to be as uh, expansive as possible in designing this tool. And uh, when we measure ex energy uh, metabolism, we do have tools already. So heat emission, that seems the most logic way of uh, measuring calories burned. Actually, technically, it's exceedingly difficult. Because in essence, you need to wrap up a person in a, uh, either in a suit or in a very small uh, environment, uh, able to account to all the energy dissipation. Uh, a much uh, uh, more uh, uh, useful and easy way is uh, using gas exchange that can be done uh, in essence by indirect calorie. So in essence, by looking at the gas uh, consumption and emission, CO2 emission, we can back calculate the energy expenditure. That can be done uh, on the metabolic charts 
or the whole room or human metabolic chamber. And that's what we have been working on. In theory, we can use uh, uh, our Fitbits, but uh, uh, what they do, so wearable devices actually guesstimate uh, the energy expenditure. What they give you is just counts of movements. Doesn't, doesn't describe how much I need to push to move my hand. Um, in terms of measuring intake, uh, you can try food diary, good luck, it doesn't work that well. Or we can stay at individuals as the, as the eating, but uh, be sure that uh, the individual will change uh, his or her behavior just because it's part of a study. That's this so-called outer effect. And so uh, that's uh, how we came to uh, get uh, the metabolic chambers uh, at VCU and chambers because there are two chambers. One is a very small one and the other one allows for uh, uh, long-term uh, studies. And, uh, uh, and so now we're going uh, in the individual presentations uh, and uh, I will have Dr. Chen presenting uh, the theoretical basis uh, and data acquisition techniques uh, and we'll present some uh, uh, kind of pushing the envelope studies uh, in a letter taking over. Chan Chan. Okay, hello everyone. So uh, my name is Shen Shen Chen. Uh, I'm a uh, faculty and uh, bio staff in internal medicine. So Dr. Chelly has given you a sneak peek of the two chambers. Um, and of course, uh, you are always welcome to drop by and uh, take a look if you haven't done that. So for patients, the chambers just look like uh, a regular living room. The big one is about three meters by four meters, and the small one is about uh, one meter by two meter. Um, for doctors, uh, you probably notice that uh, there's a foot and a trash window, uh, a blackboard, and uh, exercising equipment. All this allows uh, the physicians uh, for, uh, to design protocols uh, um, and answer metabolic related research questions uh, specific to their own interest. If you look behind these rooms, uh, um, I don't seem to be able to advance my slide. Okay, thank you. So if you look behind these rooms, so you will notice that um, there is a mechanical room that houses all the core uh, for the measurement instrument, uh, such as the uh, gas analyzers uh, from uh, Siemens in Germany. And uh, um, there are also Y uh, valves and pipes that transmit the air in and out of the chamber. Uh, and the flow controllers uh, uh, regulate the flow rates uh, to a very precise uh, uh, digit. Okay, um, next slide, thank you. So when you're inside the chamber, if you look up uh, in the ceiling, you will find uh, uh, air mixing fans uh, to help to distribute the gas exchange quickly and uh, you know, move more evenly throughout the room. I'll tell you why uh, in the next slide. Uh, we also have uh, multiple modality sensors uh, to gather additional information for medical studies, uh, such as the ECG sensors, uh, uh, EMG sensors, uh, continuous uh, uh, blood pressure monitoring machines, uh, inertial sensors to track the activity, skin temperature sensors to track like whether the person is uh, um, feeling cold or um, you know some exercise would uh, increase their um, exercise uh, increase their body temperature sorry i'm still on the last slide thanks so. um so these sensors can collect the data simultaneously within the metabolic chambers uh, um, and provides minute by minute energy uh, expenditure with all other uh, phenotypes uh, in real time. So it, it is a re remarkable uh, because you can do all these uh, studies uh, in vivo uh, without very invasive procedures. Okay, next slide. So, so how does the, uh, this instrument measure energy expenditure? The key is that the energy expenditure is measured by the oxygen consumption and the uh, carbon dioxide production. Uh, advance, please. Yeah. 
um, so this equation is uh, um, calculated uh, by a uh, scientist in 1949 from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. So this is the cornerstone of all this uh, gas exchange uh, measurement for energy expenditure, including the metabolic cart. Uh, so how does this work in our chamber? We first sent in the fresh air into the chamber, and in our case, it's the medical grade air supplied by the hospital. And uh, um, we analyze the oxygen and the carbon dioxide concentration in the fresh air before the air goes in. And in the chamber, the subject will consume uh, some oxygen and uh, uh, carbon uh, and produce some carbon dioxide. Um, so the gas concentration in the chamber will be different uh, from the gas concentration of the air before it goes in. So because of this existence of the uh, subject, by monitoring this gas concentration of expired air and compared with the uh, gas concentration of the uh, fresh air, uh, and uh, you know, we deduce the volume of the chamber and how fast the air goes in and out of the chamber, we can then deduce the uh, oxygen consumption, the volume of the oxygen consumption and the carbon dioxide production of the subject using this uh, um, first order differential equation. <clears throat> so uh, it all looks very complex, but uh, <clears throat> it's just a, a, a dynamic equilibrium uh, state uh, with, um, that you need to calculate. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Next so. So now let me show you some of the figures, how the data look like when a human is inside. The first figure is from a violinist playing violin inside the chamber. Uh, the task went from very easy to difficult. Um, so the violin was using more and more energy. So despite it's a very subtle change in movement, the chamber was able to detect all these subtle differences in energy expenditure. You can see that you know when the uh, violinist is playing, uh, is sitting down and doing some open strings, uh, the energy expenditure is about uh, 1.2 kilocal per minute. And once uh, she advances to the most difficult task, uh, the energy expenditure uh, increased to 1.4. So that's just uh, like about 0 0.4 uh, increase in the energy expenditure. The chamber was, uh, uh, you know, precise enough to be able to detect that change. Next slide. So uh, the chamber also handles the energy expenditure during exercise uh, remarkably well. Each level of the energy uh, intensity is clearly delineated both by its magnitude and and its uh, temporal position. So uh, I actually used a, a, a advanced signal processing technique to get this figure because uh, um, if you're just getting the data from regular chamber, um, these this kind of uh, dynamic state are usually not captured quite well because of some limitations of the chamber. But uh, uh, with uh, with the VCU chamber, we are actually um, able to do exercise inside a large chamber as you would uh, uh, using the metabolic cart. Okay, next slide. Um, so as Dr. Chelly mentioned, the human energy expenditure is very complex. The resting energy expenditure has many components to it, but only a small range. To make sure that our science is valid, we need to ensure the data quality uh, with careful cal calibration and maintenance. And we also need to validate it against reference data to make sure that our instruments are operating within the margin of error. Next slide. And to calibrate the uh, gas analyzers, we use either um, reference tanks with known gas concentration, or we mix the gas in-house um, to a known concentration. And then we can use a, a linear mapping method to calibrate the gas analyzers. Next slide. So for, uh, so for validation, uh, to simulate uh, there's a living human subject in the chamber, we need to uh, simulate oxygen consumption and uh, carbon dioxide uh, accumulation. Uh, 
it's easy to think of ways to accumulate the carbon dioxide. You just need to inject the carbon dioxide into the chamber. But it's not so easy to extract the oxygen uh, out to simulate the oxygen consumption. So what we actually did is inject the nitrogen into the chamber in order to drive down the uh, oxygen percentage. And this method, this validation method is called infusion with the referen reference data gathered from the infusion test. So we can then compare the uh, measurement from the chamber with the reference data and see how much they deviate from each other. Um, our validation results with the reference data are published in PLUS One. If you are interested in knowing how accurate our chambers are, how, what kind of method I actually use uh, to uh, be able to uh, do exercise study in the chambers, uh, um, or just as a general working process, uh, principles, you can look up this article in PLUS One. Uh, next slide. Um, so the reference validation study is the uh, in silico study. So how do we know uh, how our instrument actually work when we're actually measuring a human subject? So we have to validate with another instrument, uh, the metabolic cart, which is uh, the instrument uh, uh, for energy expenditure that I think that you know you can use when you don't have a chamber because uh, um, the the standard is that uh, the uh, double labeled water is the gold standard, but it doesn't provide real time data. Uh, and then uh, the next standard is the metabolic chamber. The, the, the third grade is the metabolic cart. Um, but the challenge is that we can't push the metabolic cart into the chamber to simul uh, simultaneously collect the data. So therefore we need to compare the measurement for a subject across instrument under strict conditions for example, if we're measuring the resting metabolic rate, the subject has to come in uh, at 7.30 a.m. after a night of fasting to avoid the food effect. And uh, you know, they, they have to stay there, uh, not sleeping, but you know, just to stay still in bed. So it's, uh, it's quite a uh, strict uh, protocol um, to do. Okay, next. Um, here's a picture of the uh, subject uh, uh, being measured by the two chambers and the metabolic cart. Uh, so here you see that the uh, subject is lying under this hood, uh, um, which is not very comfortable. Uh, and if you have uh, claustrophobic, uh, you're claustrophobic, then that's definitely not a very pleasant uh, experience. Uh, whereas in chamber, the person just lie in bed as, as if they were um, you know, lying in their own home. Okay, next slide. So here are some of the uh, raw data points for the resting metabolic rates for each subject, each visit, and uh, each instrument. So for each subject, if you, uh, if you check the points, they're actually not that far apart. Next slide. And for the exercise uh, study, we have uh, uh, done this. Uh, um, we have done this test uh, for each subject uh, uh, for three different uh, intensity levels, um, and uh, what you can see is like the uh, the data points look much closer. Um, but it's actually a zoom out effect because the range of the uh, metabolic rates in during exercise. Uh, are much larger than the resting metabolic rates. So, um, so we, we then did a lot of uh, uh, blend Elman uh, comparison. Next slide. We, we then did a lot of uh, blend Elman uh, analysis to compare any two of the instrument against each other and see like, you know, how much they really deviate from each other. And for the exercise, we have to do this for uh, any two instrument, um, uh, of the three uh, intensities. So like, you know, most of the data points are living within the blend element uh, limit. Um, so it shows quite good uh, agreement. Um, to give you a, a exact number for the resting metabolic rate, the maximum bias is about 0 0.07 kcal per minute. And for the exercise, it's about 0 0.5 kcal per minute. 
So it's uh, tiny uh, considering the applications. Okay, so next slide. What does it, what, the, uh, what does this all mean? So uh, one question I get from Dr. Chelly is, uh, can we use uh, the instrument uh, interchangeably? And uh, the answer is uh, yes, because uh, um, for a resting metabolic rate study, the, uh, the, uh, if, you, if you swap the uh, instrument during your study, you probably get 2% of the error. If 2% of the variation is acceptable for your study, then you can do that. And uh, for the uh, exercise study, uh, that's definitely yes, because when you are measuring a range of the um, energy expenditure, uh, the errors coming from the uh, different difference of the uh, instru instrument is tiny. It's only 0.2%. So uh, this gives us a very good signal that uh, uh, our, our instrument is not only um, very precise and accurate, but also, um, but also um, it uh, gives us some hope that, you know, if uh, we wanted to conduct uh, multi-center studies, uh, we can with these different uh, types of uh, instrument, provided they are uh, well calibrated and maintained. Okay, that's all for me. Um, thanks. Thank you. And now we're gonna speed up on the clinical studies. All right, well, good morning. So I get to um, kind of transition a little bit and have us uh, think about how can we apply uh, the metabolic chambers to conducting uh, some uh, practical clinical research. So I'm gonna share about one of the projects of interest uh, to me. Um, as I think most of this audience knows um, uh, that my uh, clinical expertise and passion is for caring for patients with diabetes and obesity across the lifespan. And my research expertise is in, um, in effective treatments uh, for adolescents and young adults with uh, obesity. And particularly, we're gonna focus on um, today uh, the specific energy associated with physical activity or um, exercise activity uh, thermogenesis. So again, as Dr. Cheller already mentioned, this is the activity, uh, the energy that's a, um, a consumed or expended uh, by um, physical activity. And specifically why I'm, I'm interested in that is probably no surprise. There's multiple um, and high quality evidence that supports the health benefits of physical activity. And we know that even small increases in physical activity are associated with significant cardiometabolic improvements. And so it is important for us to be able to um, accurately measure this. And in addition to actual physical activity, we wanna be able to accurately measure sedentary activity or sedentary behavior, which um, is an independent uh, risk factor uh, for chronic, uh, chronic disease. And so to talk about physical activity and, and kind of put what uh, the study I'm gonna talk about in context, we need to talk about how we measure physical activity. And the classic uh, measure is by the metabolic equivalent task or MET. Um, so this is a specific measure of energy expended during physical activity. And traditionally one MET is defined as the amount of oxygen that's, or calories that are consumed while an individual is uh, sitting quietly. Um, and then we'll grade different um, intensities of physical activity and the most common are light, moderate, and vigorous physical activity, and you see the definitions here according uh, to METS. And part of why we do this again is that we know that um, different um, uh, intensities of physical activity appear to have different um, uh, impact on metabolism. And just to give you some examples of moderate intensity activity, so this could be brisk walking, water aerobics, ballroom dancing, or general gardening. Vigorous intensity physical activity, so faster uh, walking, jogging, swimming laps, uh, cycling uh, uh, at, a, at a faster pace, jumping rope, or hiking uphill. The definition that people will use of sedentary activity um, is any activities, and specifically in the sitting, reclining, or lying position that require somewhere between a 1 and 1.5 mets. So in regards to my um, specific research interest, um, we know that levels of physical activity have decreased dramatically among youth, especially adolescents. Um, over 80% of adolescents fail to achieve the recommended 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity daily. Um, and that this decline is most pronounced among girls, 
racial ethnic minorities and youth with overweight and obesity. Alarmingly, um, it's estimated that 50% of African-American girls ages 16 to 17 years report participating in no physical activity uh, daily. Um, and we know that this physical inactivity is uh, a, a central contributor to the energy imbalance that leads to obesity and that, um, that you can, um, that reduced physical activity does uh, um, uh, project individuals that are, are more likely to gain um, weight over time. And we also know just as an adult that physical activity patterns are a strong predictor of whether somebody will, after they've lost weight, will be able to kind of maintain, maintain that weight loss. So certainly levels of physical activity are something that I'm, I'm interested in measuring, but it's a complex behavior and it's accurate measurement is challenging. So one of the kind of recognized standards, particularly if you're using um, uh, you're conducting a study that involves a larger number of subjects is the use of accelerometers. As Dr. Shelley mentioned, we often now, these are commonplace in our society and as they're in many of our uh, watches or pedometers or things like that. Um, in research, it is the recognized standard for objectively characterizing physical activity. Um, as we've already talked about, they're wearable devices that generate quantitative data related to uh, various intensities, and they can also be used to predict energy uh, expenditure. Um, accelerometers specifically work by continuously recording um, pre-filtered raw accelerations and that these are then converted to activity counts per defined period of time which we call an epoch. Um, the investigator then applies specific cutoff points as counts per minute um, and this is typically done uh, by software associated with the specific uh, accelerometers and we'll use those cut points to characterize physical activity um, intensity. Um, and then the relation between counts and energy expenditure uh, varies depending on age, body mass index, and fitness level. And another important thing is it also varies depending on where the accelerometer is worn. So these devices can not only be worn as the uh, on the wrist, but also around the um, uh, around the ankle or even at the uh, at the the waist. So uh, as m part of many of the clinical trials that um, I um, am a part of, we actually routinely use accelerometers to measure physical activity uh, levels. And you see some of the ongoing trials that we have here. But one of the things that we noticed is when we were actually looking at the data uh, for accelerometers, that for our adolescents with um, more severe obesity, even when they were wearing them and we would download the data, even when they had been participating in the gym and we saw that they were doing vigorous physical um, uh, vigorous intensity physical activity, which was confirmed by their heart rate, it wasn't being detected by the accelerometers using the, um, uh, the analysis methods that were widely available and frequently applied. So that led us to develop this, proto uh, this uh, uh, protocol to look at how can we better um, establish the, the appropriate cutoff points uh, for use in our research. And so um, what you see here are aims for a revised RF3 that's currently um, under uh, review and will be actually reviewed next week. Um, so aim one was to develop a standardized protocol for using the whole room indirect calorimeter to rigorously establish and validate accelerometer derived energy extended energy expenditure prediction equations and physical intensity level cut points in adolescents with overweight um, and obesity. And what the hope is, is by rigorously establishing this protocol, certainly we know that technology is changing rapidly in the field, that it will allow us to have an infrastructure that is that there are new accelerometers or even new methods for measuring and characterizing energy expenditure. We can, um, can rapidly uh, assess uh, the validity of those in our population. Um, one of the things, and then so for AIMS uh, two and three, um, we're going to validate equations for predicting energy living or energy expenditure in free living conditions using data captured from two commercially available accelerometers at different wear locations um, in adolescents with overweight and obesity, um, and then to um, optimize the cut points for defining physical activity uh, intensity levels. So the study population uh, that we're proposing is 36 late adolescent females ages uh, 12 to 17, with late adolescence being defined as greater than one year after the onset of menses. Um, for this original, uh, this initial pilot project, we are limiting it uh, to late adolescent females uh, to avoid um, kind of potential confounding effects, uh, but differences between sex as well as puberty and all of uh, the, the um, 
the girls will have a BMI in the overweight category. So the specific protocol is after conducting uh, per appropriate parental permission and assent procedures, as well as in a medical assessment um, to ensure eligibility and fitness for participation, um, they will attend a single visit at the Clinical Research Center here at VCU following a four hour fast. First, they'll have standardized anthropometric measures, including bo and body composition, which will measure by um, dual energy X-ray absorptiometry or DEXA. Um, the uh, teams will then be outfitted with four pairs of stacked accelerometers, so two ones that are um, frequently used um, with a, a separate device pair at each of the uh, four wear locations that I previously talked about. I'm not going to show you the data, but we had preliminary data that showed um, if you stack these accelerometers that you actually get identical um, counts. You can't just place them uh, sequentially up an individual's arm or else you'll get different counts based on how far it is uh, sort of down, uh, down their arm. Um, then they will enter the whole room calorimeter uh, for testing. First, they'll have measurement of resting energy expenditure over 30 minutes, and then they'll participate in, um, in a standardized physical activity trial. And so the, the, state, the structured physical activity protocol you see listed here, which will um, consist of uh, 12 different sets of activities. So these are intended and specifically designed to be activities that um, the adolescents in our studies would um, maybe frequently uh, either be involved in at baseline or some of the goals that we would want to have them doing um, as they are increasing their uh, physical activity as part of our as part of our protocols. Each activity would be completed for six minutes with an intervening five minutes of, of rest. And as um, Dr. Chen already highlighted, one of the things about um, our specific chamber is it's very sensitive with being able to conduct a study like this where you can have the patient in the chamber and see uh, very specifically how their energy expenditure changes with each of these each of these activities. Um, following that, we will so then have the raw accelerometer data from each of these wear locations and from each of the accelerometers, and then we'll have the energy expenditure data, um, and we'll use the analysis plan that you see listed here, one, to first predict energy um, expenditure equations, and then define the cut points that are most appropriate for defining light, moderate, and vigor vigorous uh, um, intensity physical activity uh, for this group of uh, patients, as well as um, to try to distinguish between sedentary and uh, light intensity. So hopefully this just gives you the flavor of, of what sorts of studies you can do in the chamber. And I'm going to um, turn it over uh, to Dr. Lee. He'll tell about another uh, project that she's working on. I'm going to unmask myself here. Um, thanks, Dr. Chelly, Wickham, and Chen. So I wanted to mention to you guys, um, give you a brief overview of my project. As many of you know, I take care of um, a lot of our patients um, with cystic fibrosis um, within our multidisciplinary adult cystic fibrosis center. Um, and I am looking at a project um, assessing um, their nutritional status um, with the uh, help of the metabolic chamber. Um, so just by way of some background, um, I think we're all pretty well aware of the fact that for our patients with cystic fibrosis, that there is a huge focus on nutrition pretty much from initial diagnosis, um, just because the body mass index um, for our patients with cystic fibrosis is really tightly linked to um, their pulmonary function um, assessed by FEV1 um, and their overall kind of health status. Um, and even though there have been significant improvements in body mass index over the past several years with this increased and ongoing diligent attention to nutritional status, that um, for many patients with cystic fibrosis, uh, median BMI still remains below goal. And most significantly, it's severely below goal for the patients who happen to have the most severe mutations and therefore the most severe pulmonary disease. Um, so there are multiple causes for energy losses in cystic fibrosis. The primary one that we think about is pulmonary exacerbations, a significant, uh, a significant amount of energy that's expended um, just with increased work of breathing, um, recurrent uh, infections and inflammation related to that. The other sources of energy loss in cystic fibrosis include malabsorption and pancreatic insufficiency, which result in decreased nutritional absorption. 
Um, we are familiar with some of the irregular eating patterns um, of many of our patients um, with CF, and um, they do have um, overall altered uh, patterns of hunger and satiety. Um, and some of this is also even further complicated by the pancreatic insufficiency that causes them to have pretty complicated pancreatic enzyme replacement schedules with that. Um, some of the other comorbidities that are very common in patients with CF, including diabetes and liver disease, can also contribute further to this increased energy expenditure that further exacerbates their malnutrition. So currently, CF Foundation nutrition guidelines recommend intakes of um, well above what's typical for um, age and sex matched healthy population controls. Um, and I think something to keep in the back of our minds is that a, a lot of these estimates the way that different centers calculate what the nutritional requirements can be are pretty variable and based on sort of predictive formulas and that most patients do not get sort of detailed metabolic um, profiling of their energy needs. Um, so um, given that um, there are a majority of patients with CF who have pancreatic insufficiency um, requiring enzyme replacement, um, it's uh, interesting to note that there's actually not a whole lot of evidence directly of the effects of these enzyme replacements on an overall energy metabolism. Um, other things that I thought would be interesting to look at is that um, for the most severely malnourished patients, we still have um, a good number of those patients who are on overnight tube feeds um, in an attempt to increase their caloric consumption. But it would be really nice to know if you know, pumping these extra calories in is actually going to have some sort of um, measurable um, improvement on their metabolic parameters and weight. Um, so um, we have looked at this slide uh, in different forms in, in many themes in this uh, overall presentation so far, but I'm focusing on the thermic effect of food for these patients, um, also known as uh, diet-induced thermogenesis, which um, depending on which kind of studies you look at can um, include, uh, can incorporate up to eight to 12% of the total energy expenditure. And we saw the, from our introductory slides that the very small degrees of changes in energy expenditure and consumption can affect weight. So these may look like small changes that we're looking at overall, but they can actually have um, significant impacts on overall weight and nutritional status. Um, so um, specific things about macronutrients that are important to consider is when you think of the energy that it is expended in order to absorb and metabolize these macronutrients is that for carbohydrates, um, as a total percent of the energy content of the macronutrient, so for carbs, it's about five to 10%, and for a lot of our CF patients, they do prefer a very carb-heavy diet. Um, it can be zero to 3% for fat, um, and for protein, um, it's significantly more, it's about 20 to 30% um, of expenditure um, that needs to be used to absorb these nutrients. So um, regarding just the overall macronutrient composition of meals, that it follows that meals with high protein or carb content tend towards a higher um, thermic effect of food than high fat meals, okay? Um, so add to that variability um, different uh, ways that you can consume meals regarding to timing or size. Um, there's a tendency towards consuming larger meals um, less frequently is actually associated with a higher thermic effect of food um, than multiple small meals or snacks. So you can see where different um, feeding patterns that you might observe in people might have a difference on their um, total uh, metabol metabolism status. Um, so also note longer times of meal consumption may also correlate with reduced thermic effect of food. So again, going back to um, differences that you might see in patterns of grazing um, for people's typical meals, might show something significantly different than somebody who's doing your usual, more typical three meals a day um, and go from there. So um, many thanks to the Department of Internal Medicine for funding this uh, pilot project. Um, so my overall hypothesis was that the thermic effect of food is something that we can measure um, with a great degree of sensitivity in this metabolic chamber. Um, and it may be a modifiable factor in our nutrition recommendations um, overall for how to optimize energy expenditure and nutrition status in our patients with CF. Um, so main things I wanted to look at was just to see how feasible it is to um, have our patients come in for you know, an overnight extended stay um, in order to um, accurately measure um, different parameters of uh, energy expenditure um, in our patients who are at baseline level of health for cystic fibrosis. Okay? Um, and then we wanted to look at potentially the intra-individual differences 
um, between different macronutrient compositions of their meals, comparing kind of high fat versus high protein supplements, um, thinking that there may be a way to optimize for an individual patient um, what the ideal balance of their carb, protein, and fat meal content might be. Um, and then because uh, up to half of our patients with cystic fibrosis are also affected by diabetes, I wanted to take a look and see if there's any relationship between glycemic excursion, um, which hyperglycemia is thought of as a pro-inflammatory state, um, the thermic effect of feeding, and resting energy expenditure in our patients with CF. Um, so just a brief overview of the overall protocol is a screening visit to ensure that they're at baseline health, explain the protocol to them, give them a tour of the metabolic chamber um, so they kind of know what to expect. Um, and then uh, two different study visits um, comparing um, uh, differences between uh, high fat and high protein meals. The, uh, before each study visit, then patients do get sort of equilibrated with just a standard insurer formula um, for the first part of the day. Uh, for this overnight visit, the first part of the day before they come into the chamber, um, this is to standardize um, what their energy intake is um, supposed to be before they come into the chamber. Um, and then they're fasting basically until um, the dinner time meal, which is gonna be done um, inside um, the metabolic chamber. Um, measurements that we would uh, propose to get at the beginning are uh, bioimpedance analysis to look um, best estimate of body composition um, and placement of a continuous glucose monitor um, to look at glycemic excursion in response to these meals. Um, so patients will either get a high fat or high protein uh, liquid meal, depending on um, which, which uh, day of the protocol, which study visit of the protocol they're in. Um, and then they just kind of relax overnight until 8 a.m. the next morning, and that gives us an adequate amount of time to measure the effect of um, their meal, to get a sense of also their resting energy expenditure as well. Um, so this, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I will leave that up for anyone who's interested later um, to look at the um, protocol in more of a diagram form. So um, there have been some challenges with this protocol um, for a lot of our patients with cystic fibrosis who are in the hospital a lot. Um, it, it's uh, been a little bit of a challenge to ask them to spend uh, a couple of extra nights in the hospital. Um, it has been challenging also because uh, we do have patients actually seen from very far away who come to our accredited cystic fibrosis center. So travel has been an issue. Um, I did want to mention something that has been helpful that we're working on. Um, I did get approval for, uh, this is good for anyone who's interested in uh, utilizing the services of the CRSUs, that there is a voucher program that's available that you can apply for to help offset some of the expenses of the studies that you want to perform um, in the CRSU um, and even our metabolic chamber. Um, and that's something that I've been um, um, able to uh, increase the potential reimbursement for our patients for their participation in the study. Um, so hopefully as soon as the coronavirus situation improves that we'll be able to use that um, as an opportunity to work on our recruitment. And um, those are the main things that I have for now. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I'm asking myself and uh, moving on the last stretch of the, of the talk, uh, we're going to change gear and uh, uh, looking at energy expenditure in thyroidex optimized patients. So for whoever uh, has a, uh, attended an endocrine clinic uh, uh, and a patient comes for evaluation of weight gain, uh, the first question is uh, the thyroid. And uh, this is a uh, um, a Florida cat for all intents and purposes. So uh, actually it's really important, uh, uh, or at least uh, from the standpoint of patients uh, with thyroid disease, weight gain uh, is a common complaint in patients uh, affected by hypothyroidism. Surprisingly, there is very little objective data. So we really don't know much uh, uh, what the weight trajectory is uh, and what the weight gain is. On the other hand, uh, from the experimental standpoint, uh, keep in mind that patients who are devoid of thyroid, functional thyroid tissue uh, and on, are on treatment of levothyroxine rely entirely on the conversion of exogenous T4 into T3 to achieve uh, a thyroid hormone signaling. Um, in patients who are treated for hypothyroidism, up to 40% complain of some degree of residual hypothyroid symptoms. We can argue back and forth whether those are real symptoms or uh, this, uh, 
differential versus the perception of what uh, would be uh, been well, but that, that's a point. Patients do not feel okay. And uh, uh, there are experimental data that indicate that uh, the addition of T3 that will be lost uh, from the production of, uh, uh, from the thyroid might work. And, uh, <clears throat> and in essence, uh, the lack of the endogenous, meaning thyroid-derived T3, may cause uh, inadequate delivery of hormonal signal, which could be caused uh, also worsened by polymorphism in genes involved uh, in the transcription of proteins uh, that are involved uh, in the thyroid hormone signaling or in the conversion of T4 to T3. When we move into the clinical arena, uh, combination uh, levothyroxine leotironine uh, have provided in consistent trial, but most studies were uh, underpowered and technically flawed. So uh, another thing that we know is that if we treat patients uh, with hypothyroidism with, uh, with a T4, the CONT3 goes on the low end of normal, and uh, the overall estimation of uh, T3 production from the thyroid is approximately 15 micrograms per day. And there is really no clear uh, indication or uh, consensus of, of the ideal formulation of, of uh, combination therapy. Conversely, uh, uh, we, uh, when I was back at the NIH, we demonstrated that uh, treatment with leotinone alone results in weight loss in decrease in body weight. So those were individuals who were switched from levothyroxine to leotironine, and there was a crossover double-blind intervention. You see there is a significant weight loss while maintaining TSH, and also a decrease in, uh, in cholesterol. And uh, from the experimental perspective, patients devoid of endogenous production of thyroid hormone, meaning patients with uh, with thyroidectomy are an ideal experimental model to study the metabolic effects of thyroid hormone formulations. So uh, the question is, uh, why don't we give uh, one pill with T4 and T3? Well, uh, the problem is that thyroidironin has a short half-life and has significant uh, peak levels which are above a normal range for individuals. And uh, uh, this has been uh, demonstrated. This is a, a paper we, we, we wrote with Dr. Van Tassel. As you see, there is a very steep uh, absorption and then a decrease. And this is a small dose of, le of uh, leotironin. Conversely, by using this data, we've been able to generate a, um, a pharmacokinetic model whereby Five, milligram, five micrograms uh, of levothyroxine uh, substituted, um, rather, 10, milligram, 10 micrograms of levothyroxine substituting 25 microgram, uh, I'll scratch it, 10 micrograms of leotironine, which is T3, when substituting 25 micrograms of levothyroxine and uh, administered on a twice daily regimen would provide uh, a significant increase in T3 levels without uh, uh, achieving uh, uh, peak levels above normal range. So in essence, it would be safe and feasible. Also, uh, uh, Christine Wynn, uh, who is an undergrad student here at BCU, performed uh, um, with Lee Kang, uh, our best statistician, a meta-analysis, uh, uh, and out of uh, uh, 3,500 patients uh, uh, among the 17 studies, she demonstrated that there is indeed uh, an increase in body weight uh, following thyroidectomy, and even uh, eliminating patients uh, who had cancer and so had suppressive therapy or uh, started uh, from hyperthyroidism, there is still a significant increase in body weight. But there is huge variability between studies. So what we want to do is to characterize changes in energy metabolism following thyroidectomy in response to leotironin levothyroxine versus levothyroxine alone therapy. To determine the effects of thyroidectomy in response to therapy on cardiovascular and endothelial function, and to characterize the changes in metabolism following uh, lipid metabolism following thyroidectomy. So in other words, uh, first of all, we want to see whether changing the therapy 
makes uh, any effect uh, on the body weight, which is what patients really care about. But also we want to look for safety on cardiovascular system and uh, uh, changes uh, in lipid metabolism. So this is uh, uh, the study we're proposing uh, is a double blind uh, parallel study. And what is specific about the study is that we want to gather patients and study patients before they undergo total thyroidectomy. So uh, we we'll would we'll have patients with indication to total thyroidectomy who will undergo metabolic studies uh, while in a state of eutyroidism, uh, endogenous eutyroidism, then uh, uh, they undergo uh, total thyroidectomy, and then uh, we uh, treat either in, with levothyroxine or levothyroxine and leotyroline with a target TSH that will be as close as possible to the baseline before surgery. And we will perform metabolic testing in the metabolic chamber at three and six months. And those are, uh, uh, again, target uh, patients with thyroid uh, exclusion criteria cardiovascular uh, disease or indication for TSH suppression, so advanced thyroid cancer. Then they will get randomized. And uh, this is the treatment scheme. And then we will perform a, a therapy adjustment at six weeks and then three months. Primary endpoint changes in body weight and energy expenditure following thyroidectomy. Keep in mind that the levothyroxine alone arm will also provide a natural history of weight changes on patients undergoing thyroidectomy. And secondary endpoints, again, cardiovascular and lipid parameters. So where do we stand? We resubmitted the grant we had a decent encouraging impact score, so fingers crossed. And uh, uh, just last week, uh, we got the IRB approving uh, our protocol. It's been a long and painful uh, process, so fingers crossed. So in conclusion, uh, and I believe we made it on time, um, why did we want to uh, present uh, uh, studies on metabolic change? Well, it's a very interesting instrument, which has many pros. It's an accurate and precise tool for energy expenditure assessment. It is flexible in the sense that uh, it can address, uh, and you just had a very uh, limited flavor of what we can query, uh, can address uh, multiple questions while at the same time being comfortable for patients. Uh, over the last two months, we've been uh, using masks uh, quite too much. Uh, adding a, a face mask and a snorkel while you're doing exercise becomes really unpleasant. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so in essence, it's a very flexible and uh, uh, user-friendly tool to measure energy expenditure. On top of that, uh, uh, our uh, chamber design, the um, software changes made by Dr. Chen, and, uh, the, uh, and the other tools we have uh, at our ends, uh, given the opportunity of coupling with other recording device, uh, gives a vast array of, uh, um, of answers we can give to any viable questions or any crazy question. It is a complex system, so it requires expertise, it requires maintenance. Uh, there are major confounders. So yes, we are very precise, but at the same time, there is a huge inter-individual variability on the baseline. So uh, the usual question we get, well, why don't you put me in the, in the metabolic chamber and you tell me whether I and I burn too much or too little. It really doesn't say, uh, doesn't answer the question. What I can do, I can put you in the chamber and then perform any kind of permutation in a, a stimulation test and then look at as how you individually respond to the, uh, to the standardized test. So it's best inter suited for intervention studies and for repeated measures and brainstorms are welcome. Last slides. 
this is uh, actually a partial slide uh, of uh, uh, ongoing and potential collaboration. And uh, the other point is that no idea is too crazy. Um, so we're working uh, uh, with the Cancer Center looking at the uh, changes in energy expenditure on cancer associated cachexia. We just completed the data looking at what does a big whack of uh, T3 to your cardiovascular system, meaning are we killing patients if we give them a single dose or not. Uh, we're looking at violin players, uh, that's probably near and dear to me. And then uh, we have uh, various studies uh, uh, in collaboration with the cardiology division. Also, we work with bariatric surgery and uh, uh, NGI on liver cancer, uh, on liver, uh, liver transplant. Um, we have uh, multiple uh, ideas we have been fiddling about, uh, sorry for the violin referral <coughs> reference. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, came out uh, in the uh, physiology course with some residents is what happens uh, with the residents, whether they're uh, uh, on the outpatient rotation or whether they're taking uh, uh, night calls. And it's actually a very valid question that uh, uh, I think it's worth somebody to take the lead and work on that. So uh, almost on time, um, it takes a village to run a study. And uh, uh, this is again just a partial uh, uh, acknowledgement of, of all the individuals that uh, have uh, helped us uh, in working with. And uh, um, it would be dismissive of me if I do not uh, recognize uh, uh, Dr. Nesler, uh, who told me when uh, he was uh, uh, hiring me, by the way, do you do anything about metabolic chambers? Because uh, that, that was in the works. And uh, Keith Mulloy, that was uh, at that time uh, uh, our division administrator who made things happening and uh, was able to write the contract in one year from uh, getting the chamber from contract to built in one year. And that was uh, really remarkable. And thank you for your attention. Do we have a question and answers? No. I'll fade in this answer. Somebody, anybody, nobody. Okay, a violin player enters. <laughs> All right. Good to go. Thank you all.